Um, also, I want to invite some of you who might be interested in kind of the voluntarist viewpoint, if you've been following things at freekeen.com, uh, right as soon as uh, Mark's speech or session is over, in the Free Talk Live studio, we'll be uh, screening Talkback. It's a program out of Keene, New Hampshire, on WKBK, and a lot of the locals in Keene kind of make a habit of listening to the show and calling in from a pro-liberty perspective. So this morning, we'll be having people listen and call after call after call. Because normally we just have a couple people call in, so we're really going to just blast them with calls this morning. That's going to be going on in the Free Talk Live studio, and so look forward to seeing you later on today. I want to introduce somebody that is an incredible uh, guy, a great thinker, and a, a wonderful author. He wrote the book Adventures in Legal Land, a real eye-opener. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't read it, you can get your own copy over at markstevens.net. That's Mark with a C, markstevens.net. He's also the host of the No State Project, which I believe is going to be relaunching on the air here sometime this month. 21st. So, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Stevens. I just want to thank everyone with the Liberty Summit, especially Chris Lawless uh, for bringing me here. I appreciate that and making it all possible. Uh, thanks to everyone who supported my work so far and my wife, of course, who makes it possible, who let me be here. Is this, did we just lose this? Yeah, you just lost it. And I pulled the hotel. Put it in the corner. <laughs> You guys really want to hear me today, I guess. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, my bad might be lost. All right. Well, I guess I... Sam's here, I'm getting sound. I guess I don't need to ask if there's any federal agents here now. They probably can't make a nice work. Who set my, did my old network set up this system? <laughs> I'm from New York, so I could probably reach everyone in the, the next hotel over. <laughs> I say do it. <laughs> Is it a coincidence that Ian got to say all that he needed? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the club's called. They're shutting you off. All right. Uh, is it one minute? Well, we got the website in, so that. Oh, yeah. Hey. Thank you. And again, thank, thank you to Ian. Ian from Free Talk Live, everyone. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. It was very humbling to be asked, uh, when Chris asked me to do this, I was very humbled uh, to, to be able to speak today. That was, uh, well, of course, humble until I found out that Stefan Molin, who was also speaking, so. These are the jokes, people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I don't see a flag here, but uh, does anyone want to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> so my talk today was on delusions. And I figured since we're talking about delusions, let's see if we have any citizens or residents in the audience. Oh, we got a few. Good. Uh, I'm hoping by the end of this talk you'll be offended enough to realize you're not. Well, my intent is to inform today and bring some information you've never heard before. I uh, just want to discuss a little bit the road that led me here. Uh, Start on Long Island. I know, big surprise. Uh, grew up on Long Island, and I can tell you, I can tell you're probably thinking, hey, I didn't drive all this distance to hear some schmuck from Long Island ramble on for a few hours. But just trust me, it'll be worth it. Uh, I gotta tell you, but why March? Why is this held in March? Is there some symbolic thing between, you know, 3 5, 3 6, 3 7, like 322? 322, these are the jokes, people. Does anyone. <laughs> Maybe the mic going out. That's a good thing. <laughs> I figured here everyone would get 322. Okay. 420. 420, yes. Well, 420, whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Someone from Long Island talking about delusions, talking about the pot calling the kettle black. But, uh, we've all been raised and live on delusions. Some are harmless, and then, of course, there are the ones that concern us today, 
And I know this quote's been butchered, but Voltaire is credited with saying, as long as people believe in absurdities, they will continue to commit atrocities. He's also supposed to have said all murders are punished unless they kill in large numbers instead of the sound of trumpets, but instead now trumpets, I think they do it to Wagner's right of the Valkyries. But, it's, uh, but it shows what escapes most people. And I had this experience on the plane yesterday. And a woman just kept on looking behind, the one in front. Yes, I had to sit in the back of the plane, the last row. This woman just kept on looking back with this look on her face. Every time I would say something, I, I just, at the end, I just had to turn and say, did I offend you in some way? Uh, no. Why do you keep looking at me like that? Uh, it's kind of a look I'm sure a lot of people listening to me on the radio get. What the hell are you talking about? Especially when I'm somewhere like coast to coast. But they have profound psychological effects. And I've spoken about this a lot on the show. And the new book, which is going to be out this year, I hope, uh, I go into a lot more depth than that. But it's the psychological effects that are so important that we're going to discuss. It explains why, when you're on the way, and a lot of us flew in, why you have to go through a full body cavity search to go to the airport. So I just thought it was kind of ironic as I'm going through this that I'm on, you know, they, so they do the fist. They're like, so where are you going today? The Liberty Forum! <laughs> so, I tell you, if you don't see the irony in that, you spend too much time watching Fox News. <laughs> it started back in the 90s. I had, a, I had a job making money. Well, I used to get pieces of paper that I would exchange for other pieces of paper. And I was paid on commission. And I was fired so that they could bring somebody in on a fixed salary. So they thought they could get somebody for one-fifth the price of what I was making. And I'm a union guy, but I decided since all that money was taken from the check and it was something I had to do, I filed a grievance. Steph's head is going to explode here in a second. It's, it's, it's like, <laughs> calm down. It's not that bad, Steph. So I filed a grievance and they appointed a lawyer. My first experience with a lawyer. And uh, we go to what they call a hearing. Anyone been to a union hearing? Pleasant experience? Yeah. <laughs> Not as bad as going to court. Be a little more gentle with that fist. <laughs> so what it boiled down to was they were trying to make an argument, oh, well, they can fire you for any reason unless, uh, you know, unless you've been working more than 180 days. So I figured, well, I've been here about 11 months. I think I got that covered. So the attorney, he fought like an animal. He was great. We get the decision back about six months later, and they said that, uh, well, 180 days didn't mean 180 days. It meant working days, and then they had to, it did, you know, you didn't work 180 consecutive working days. And it, and it didn't matter that you could prove that. And the attorney uh, just didn't want to do anything with it. He basically said, screw you, have a nice day. So I figured. I'll appeal it, <laughs> right? You figure you got the facts and the law on your side, right? I'll appeal it, yeah. So this is where I started working in the law library, learning how to do this. Has anyone ever researched New York State labor law? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. New York State labor law, not that easy to follow. These are the jokes. <laughs> Be afraid, let it out. New York State labor law is as big as probably as the New Hampshire code itself. Okay? Uh, not an easy thing to get through. And, uh, and then there was the court procedure you had to go through. mind boggling If you think the Internal Revenue Code is bad, put these two monsters together. So I went through all this, learned how to use a law library, put this whole brief together, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do good. I'm going to do great. The judges are going to go and do what the union did because the boss owns the union. That's the way it goes. Boom, I'm going to get it this time. Right? <sighs> do a little research. If anyone is familiar with Route 112 on Long Island in Medford, you pretty much know where I'm going with this. Anyone? Okay. We know Neil Feldstein owns most of Route 112. He was the defendant. The building the court was in was owned by Neil. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing at me already. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
I know. I still went in thinking I had a chance. <laughs> now you can. <laughs> Did I say I was from Long Island? I just made that clear. Now, now there's no, 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 no misunderstandings. So I'm going to... Now you're getting into your A material here. Oh, boy, I tell you. I want to do my... I'm going to reenact the trial. Now trust me, it, take, it, it, it takes under an hour, but it's worth it. I come in. Lawyer for the... Uh, Defendant comes in, the judge sits down, doesn't even, doesn't, he doesn't even look up. Judgment for the defendant, case closed, and then he got up, <laughs> walked out. And I'm uh, standing there, you remember the Bugs Bunny cartoons where they flashed the jackass? <laughs> that was me. Sort of like right now. And he just walked out and that was it. Attorney took his briefcase, didn't even take anything out, just walked out. I'm just standing there, empty room. An empty, silent room, much like this one. <laughs> well, at least at this point I decided to cut the losses, not go any further. I just moved on. I moved out to Phoenix, and I came across some Patriot writings. This is, you know, somewhere down the line, we get into some of these writings where someone's writing, you don't need a driver's license, you don't have to pay taxes, there's no law that says you have to pay, so I investigated this. The problem that I had, if you can look at it as a problem, that I had some experience with court procedure. But if you figure, look, I'll tell you right now, if you, if you understand New York State court procedure, you're pretty much good to go everywhere. I mean, New Hampshire should be a no-brainer. So that, you know, being a little cocky, hey, I can, you know, figure it lady. Let's see if this is true. So what did I do? I did what someone like Lauren did. I took the plates off the car and gave them all back in the driver's license, gave it back to DMV. Have a nice day. Took about a year. Boy, did the tickets come in. I had nine stops in just a few weeks. I had one, I was going to the South Mesa Justice Court and got stopped. I said, well, I'm on my way to court. I can't, hey, you're going to have a good excuse. You tell the judge, you give the judge this, he'll understand. So I get prepared for this first time in court. And I gotta tell you, if you're happy to go to court, you got the wrong attitude. <laughs> Anyone who looks forward to going to court and getting a pound of flesh, wrong, wrong idea, wrong mindset. Uh, they'll spot you a mile away. What will they do? Ian's a good example. <laughs> I'm not saying that you copped an ad, <laughs> that Ian did. Anyway, if you're going, you know, you're going with kind of an attitude, they pick up on that pretty quick. So I figured this was an old brainer. I had a script. I role played. I'm gonna get him. And the judge didn't listen to a damn word I had to say. Just put the cop on the stand anyway. I figured, okay, great. I can take care of the cop. Now I got you. And so basically, I asked the police officer, Pat Huerta, little guy, and. All his friends came to watch, all these DPS officers came to watch this. And at the time I had not read Jerry Spence's book about not taking a witness's dignity away, which I would suggest to everyone is really, really good advice when you go to court, regardless of how bad the witness has treated you, don't take his dignity away. I did this once and uh, the, co the judge was a former police captain. Do a little research on John Orr. Not a nice guy. Anyway, so I'm asking the police officer, did you give me a ticket for having no driver's license? He said, yes. Do you know what a license is? He said, no. Okay, we're done. I said, well, given the fact that the witness doesn't know what a license is, he's not qualified to testify. <laughs> right? The judge looks at him and says, Officer, do you know what a license looks like? <laughs> yes, I do, sir. Good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I learned an important lesson. You don't say the officer's unqualified. Who needs to say the officer's unqualified? Yeah. His attorney, the officer, or the judge. Because when I say it, it goes over like some of my jokes here. Doesn't it? <laughs> 
So that was kind of a shock. I'm going to give the guy's name here, too, if anyone wanted to look it up. Very famous name in, the, in Arizona. His name is Donald Skousen. Yes, he is a cousin of the famous Cleon Skousen. Not all of them are as honest as him. And what, didn't he write, uh, well, he's written a number of books on, on libertarianism. His cousin there, Donald, not so much a libertarian. <laughs> not so much. And the funny is, this guy teaches civics. He teaches a law class at M Mesa Community College. Go figure. Another case, and this time it was in front of an attorney, Brian Strong, who actually was supposed to be the judge on the cover of my book, Adventures in Legal Land, but it took me so long to find an artist that when I told her, oh, this in fact is Brian Strong, the uh, head judge of the Mesa, the Mesa uh, Justice Court, she backed off. In front of Brian Strong, I figured I got him to this time. I impeached every witness. They brought five against me. Lauren probably understands, you know, you usually get a lot of cops at scenes. So there was five officers that came to, to get me. I didn't produce my identification fast enough. That was not a joke. So I go in, I figured I impeached every witness. I didn't say the witnesses were incompetent, the judge did. So I figure I'm well on my way. The judge still doesn't throw it out. Now imagine, why would a judge not throw out a case where he said the witnesses were all incompetent and lied and changed their testimony? Because it's not about justice. So because I had been given the ticket for failure to produce the identification, I went in with Brown versus Texas. Everyone familiar with Brown versus Texas? Okay, Brown versus Texas, unanimous Supreme Court decision came out of a small city in Texas, and a uh, unanimous Supreme Court decision is a, is a pretty big deal because you've got, you've got all these attorneys agreeing and uh, it holds the most legal weight as a precedent. And they unanimously held that it's illegal to arrest somebody just to ascertain their identity. So how could I lose? That's what I was arrested for. And he sneers down at me, that's your interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just read it verbatim. Now, I was shocked, I was speechless. I know my wife is saying, you know, you know yeah, right. I didn't know what to come back with. I didn't expect someone to say, when you read it verbatim, that's your interpretation. But in a sense, he's right. Just because I'm literate in English doesn't mean that he's literate. <laughs> See, now when I get a line like that, I would say, well, all right, what's your interpretation of it? You tell me what you get out of this. Well, if you don't like it, you're going to appeal it. Give me something to appeal. Give me something. Even the courts have said, to review of an abuse of discretion, the judge has to provide the reasons for his decision. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, I did win most of the cases. Well, I don't know. I guess it depends on the perceptions you have. I won most of the cases, and it kept me doing this. So my wife would think it was unfortunate. But I continued doing research and helping people, and I helped some friends. And we got a number of traffic cases kicked out, and so that kind of snowballed what people heard about what was happening, so I started doing work full-time, doing consulting. Yeah, some would say I'm practicing law without a license, but... What's a license? Well, it, it, it's the whole thing. A license is a tax to do that which would be criminal or, or otherwise not permitted. Uh, I don't believe in giving advice anyway or giving suggestions, legal or otherwise, uh, because that's where people get in trouble. However, I may change my mind today and break some laws. I think it's against the law to give legal advice in New Hampshire, right? Yeah, it's a misdemeanor. Ah, let's break the law now. Go to court on time. I'm giving you advice. When you get a warrant and you get a ticket, you go to court on time. I just broke the law, right? What a stupid law. Thank you. Encourage me to do a lot more law breaking here, so before we get done, we're really going to get into some legal advice. But when it comes to things that are serious, when it's your life in hand, actually, don't take advice, especially from an attorney. I know people may point to someone like Larry B. Kraft and say, Yeah, he won for Vernie Kuglin. Anyone read that transcript? No one read the transcript of that case? It's on my website. I know it's markstevens.net now. The prosecutor. After she was acquitted, said to the judge, I'm going to paraphrase, 
You've got to order her to pay her taxes. And the judge came back and said, I'm not the IRS, it's your job. So you figure Vernie and her attorney would have, goodbye, have a nice day. No. Larry Beecraft, with no prompting whatsoever, Your Honor, my client will file those returns and pay her taxes. Unless I have a transcript that has been altered. It's on my website, marstevens.net. It's also on the forum, so it's there. And so far, Beecraft or any of his representatives have never come back and said, that's bull, I never said that. So. I take the transcript for what it's worth. So just keep that in mind. We're doing, as I was working with people, and we were doing a lot of traffic stuff and taxes, I'm doing more and more research, and there was one particular patriot guru out of Minnesota who had a oath of office because he claimed the citizen was the highest political office, and how could you be a citizen, how could you have political office without an oath of office? So he had people filing an oath of office with the county clerk or the county recorder. Anyone familiar with this? That's good. <laughs> and he's making claims that preamble citizens are not subject to legislative acts. It's pretty good. I said, can I, you know, wow, can I get the citations? And uh, no, he wouldn't do it. He said, you got to pay $600 even though you work for someone's so eye. So I went to the county recorder and just got a free copy. <laughs> I have my more legal advice. If you want something like that, go to the county recorder. It costs you about a buck. And I researched all the citations. And lo and behold, every damn one of them wasn't true. Big shock, right? So I'm bringing this to their attention, and how do you think they met? You know, how, how do you think they, you know, they, they you know, because here all his money's being made on this, and I'm saying, hey, Carl, this is not what this case says. And you don't know, you don't know Carl, that's why. That was a pretty good impression, by the way. <laughs> so, during this time I was researching immunity. Why was it possible for judges to do, like, put you in jail for contempt with no basis whatsoever and have absolutely no responsibility to you at all? And so I was researching immunity and I came across a case called Bowers vs. DeVito. I don't have the citation off the top of my head, but it is in the book and it's on the website. And what Bowers vs. DeVito showed was that the government had no duty to protect. So I did what anyone would do. Well, let's shepherdize the case. And shepherdizing, all that means is shepherds is a series of books where they take court cases and they follow them. See if certain points were overturned or if they were modified in some way. Uh, so, and then they also have other cases that cite that case. So let's take, all right, Bowers first veto. That's just got to be the lunatics of D.C. What does that uh, what's have to do with Arizona? What does that have to do with any, you know, anything outside of D.C.? Every single state Supreme Court has said the same thing for 200 years. And the Supreme Court of the United States has too. And any attorney that you'll talk to cannot get through law school without going through DeShaney versus uh, State of Wisconsin. That's where they're weeding you out in law school. Because that particular case, the child was, I believe, killed by the father. There was a protective order and they sued and they said, well, you didn't protect our child. And they said, well, there's no duty to protect your child. And so as an attorney, where you basically, you know, sell your soul, is you have to be able to argue both sides passionately. You have to be a zealous advocate. By zealous, I mean a liar, where you have to take a position you don't believe in. I mean, what other, oh, I better not get into that. <laughs> what other profession? <laughs> the point being, that they had, there was no duty to protect. So when they brought this complaint, it didn't present a case. And it was thrown out. There's actually a case in California on my website. It's the Antioch City case where the California Supreme Court said that police are under absolutely no legal duty to do anything. So I guess the beatings, killings, and rapings are from a moral obligation rather than a legal one. <laughs> 
That struck me. Because here I'm doing all this research about citizens and this and this and that. And, and I had known that a citizen is what? Does anyone know what a citizen is? Ian. Uh, an individual with an, uh, a duty of obligation, to allegiance to the state in return for an obligation of protection. Right. It's a member of the body politic owing a duty of allegiance and return for a duty of protection. So it hit me. If there is no duty to protect anyone, now I just want to address one issue right now because they'll say, you'll read cases that say this, the duty is not owed to you, Stefan, as an individual. It is owed to you as a group. So when they shoot it down and they try to argue with you, oh, that doesn't mean anything, that there's no state, that doesn't mean you're not a citizen, it just means there's no duty to protect you as an individual. It, the duty is to the whole body of people. Now let's pretend I'm an insurance agent. My duty to insure you <laughs> doesn't go to you as a person, but to everybody. I insure everybody. So you can take your claim and Shut it with the TSA. So we all know, we all know that that's, that's not a legitimate, I mean, that, that's an easy way to explain it. You don't need a Supreme Court case, you don't need any legal precedent. The fact that they're saying they insure everybody or that everyone is, is entitled to protection instead of just the one is total BS. That's ridiculous. So just on basic principles of common sense, and, and my, my, I have a nine-year-old that understands that. So don't buy that. So if you present this information, they give you this nonsense, oh, it's all to a whole, don't read the rest of the case, Mark, don't cherry pick. Yes, it does say that in the case, but it's BS. Well, look what it came from. It came from a group of attorneys. So to go through, and I know I've mentioned this before, but it's part of the delusion. There's no duty to protect, which means there's no duty of allegiance to. And if the only thing that makes you a citizen is a duty of allegiance in return for duty of protection, there's no citizens and no body politic, there is no state. And it's really easy to demonstrate that. You didn't get a chance to get that far, Ian, but if you're in court, and many people who have, who have been to the website and have got the book have gone into court and done this, all you do is you challenge the guy who comes in with the cheap suit, saying, I represent the state. Ask him for proof. <laughs> you think it's funny, but I'll tell you right now, the prosecutor doesn't. <laughs> And if you follow the show, you had, you've heard people call in, full archives, markstevens.net. You, you hear calls, people will call in, that have done this. And in almost every case where the judge does not help his little buddy, the prosecutor, the prosecutor has withdrawn the charges. They won't tell you this. But in every stage of a court proceeding, whether it's criminal or civil, the burden of proof on issues is the same throughout. Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. There's a lot of cases like that that show that and are on the website. Which means, if you're in a civil traffic case, the burden of proof when you show up the first time is by preponderance of evidence. So if they have to prove standing, it's by preponderance of evidence. If you're in a criminal case and you're there to plead and you're asking some questions, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, do opinions of a prosecutor count as evidence to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt? No. That's why in my script, it's one of the questions. It's a set of questions, one of the more important ones. You ask the judge, anything this schmuck say admissible? I also no. Everything the prosecutor says is supposed to be backed by evidence. But as we know, not always the case. Not in practice. So, you can imagine though how many people wanted to hear there was no such thing as a citizen or state. This really shook people. And it was bad enough when they first realized there was no obligation by taxes. Now they hear that they're not citizens. Anyone here still think they're a citizen? I'm looking over here. <laughs> Come on, you can put your hands up. Most people didn't want to hear it, especially someone like this Patriot Guru, because he was making his money selling $600 packages to file an oath of office as a citizen. That was insane. Uh, so no, they weren't too happy. So uh, I didn't work with them anymore. 
At least in my case, when I didn't work with them, the gun didn't come out. So, that was an inside joke. I, <laughs> but about this time, a friend of mine, who I wouldn't have expected this, went to his house, and he had a copy. He had run through a, a photocopy of a book by a man named Santa Spooner. The Constitution, no trees in the Constitution, no authority. Now, I thought... But at some point in time, the government got corrupt, and they just didn't want to protect us anymore. So the whole thing collapsed in on its head. And then I read that. I read the, I, I couldn't believe it. I already knew there were no state and citizens, that uh, here was somebody else. Because everyone else I had talked to thought I was insane. Even clients thought I was helping win cases. <laughs> <laughs> I had somebody who uh, didn't call me for six months. I said, what, what the hell you been? I'll clean up the language. He basically said, I couldn't stand you. What the, yeah, what, what, you, you. You tore my reality out and didn't replace with anything. Anyone ever hear that? Stefan is probably get that every day. <laughs> so people weren't happy. Imagine I helped get traffic cases or a tax case thrown out and you're pissed off at me. <laughs> but they say in science, let the data speak whatever the data say. That's what the data said. There's no, it's all an illusion. But the first part in particular blew me away. Not just because it was somebody finally saying something that I had come upon in, 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 a, in a unique way, but it was the simplicity and how devastating it was. I'm going to read it again. Of course, because Sam is filming. And this is from uh, the Sanders Spooner's Constitution of No Authority. Is there anybody here who's not read this essay? Whole. Why not? All right. Your homework tonight. <laughs> you're, you're about to hate me. But the Constitution has no inherent authority or obligation. It has authority or it has no authority or obligation at all, unless as a contract between man and man. And it does not so much as even purport to be a contract between persons now existing. It purports at most to be only a contract between persons living 80 years ago. It was written in 18. 69. It can be supposed to have been a contract then only between persons who had already come to years of discretion, so as to make so as to be competent to make reasonable and obligatory contracts. Furthermore, we know historically that only a small portion, even of the people then existing, were consulted on the subject or asked or permitted to express either their consent or dissent in any formal manner. That would include Canadians, by the way. Uh, those persons, if any, who did give their consent formally are all dead now. They're long dead now. Most of them have been dead 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And the Constitution, so far as it was their contract, died with them. They had no natural power or right to make it obligatory upon their children. It is not only plainly impossible in the nature of things that they could bind their posterity, but they did not even attempt to bind them. That is to say, the instrument does not purport to be an agreement between anybody but, quote, the people, end quote, then existing. Nor does it either expressly or impliedly assert any right, power, or disposition on their part to bind anybody but themselves. Let us see. Its language is, and you'll recognize this, we the people of the United States, that is, the people then existing in the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. It is plain in the first place that this language, as an agreement, purports to be only what it most really was, a contract between the people then existing and of necessity binding as a contract only upon those then existing. In the second place, the language neither expresses nor implies that they had any intention or desire, nor that they imagined they had any right or power to bind their posterity to live under it. It does not say that that posterity will, shall, or must live under it. It only says, in effect, that their hopes and motives in adopting it were that it might prove useful to their posterity as well as to themselves by promoting their union, safety, tranquility, and liberty. I know we all ask ourselves the same thing when we hear that the first time. My gosh, it's so damn simple. How in the hell did this get past me? And he makes it even clearer as he goes through. He gives an example of someone building a house. I am building this house for me and my posterity. That doesn't mean his grandchildren have to live in it. 
it seems so simple when you take it in a different context. And I have gone through, I can't tell you how many times I've had to deal with IRS agents. And you ask them point blank, what is the Constitution? And they know that, uh, that's the supreme law of the land. Does anyone agree with that? No. Why? That's just a legal opinion. It's just an opinion. I didn't ask you for an opinion. I just want to know what it is. I don't care what it says. Tell me what it is. If I say, what is a table? And you say, it's got a blue thing, skirt on it. It doesn't tell me what table is. So when I ask what the Constitution is, and you'd be amazed. In the 13 years or so I've done it, not one agent has ever known what the Constitution is. It's a goddamn piece of paper. Thank you. <laughs> it's not just a piece of paper, sir. It is four. <laughs> it is four pieces of paper. Did anyone sign the Constitution? You, you, you're right. No. No. But people say, but I can see George Washington's name right on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In witness thereof. Is a witness a signatory to the agreement? No. So who signed as a signatory to bind themselves? As I'm going to get into, these aren't stupid people. They knew what the Constitution meant. They knew what the implications were. They didn't sign it. So imagine an IRS agent is saying, see what attorneys and even some forensic accountants, you can't argue that they don't have a right to tax or a right to the property, just the amount. Well, I can. I do it every, all the time. Well, you can't. You, you, you shouldn't do it again. Well, why not? The whole basis of the power of tax is these four damn pieces of paper. I think it's pretty important. Try to get a judge to take judicial notice of the Constitution is a four piece of paper. <laughs> Anyone know the name Susan Ilston? Stanley Hilton was suing the Bush administration. You ever remember about 9 11, the Mariana case? This doesn't vote well for you guys on Free Talk Live, I gotta tell you. <laughs> wow! Okay. Uh, Stanley Hilton was an attorney with uh, Bob Dole, and he was suing on behalf of a uh, woman named Mariana, whose husband died in 9-11. And they put the, the, the suit was thrown out by Susan Ilston. Susan Ilston, I personally worked, I was in front of, and ran off the bench when I asked for a judicial notice the Constitution was a written instrument. I actually had a certified copy in my hand. So... Pretty tough to prove someone has a tax liability when it's all based on four pieces of paper no one bothered to sign. Who looks like the crazy one now? <laughs> I, I, I got these papers! All right. <laughs> okay. Good for you. I have them too. <laughs> I'm trying to take your house because I have papers. So, but why does this go past us? Why do we not realize it's just a damn piece of paper? And the reason is because there are people who have spent a lot of money and time and energy making sure that our minds are filled with so much damn junk that even when you're exposed to a truth like that, you'll fight against it emotionally. You can ask Stefan Molyneux. He knows this very well. You've experienced it probably more than I have. Okay, and you still do. I've done hundreds of radio shows, although Free Talk Live, I enjoy the most. <laughs> but Free Talk Live is not a mainstream show, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I just mean you don't have mainstream ideas being espoused by the host. And even though you can get a host to agree, well, a citizen is what? <coughs> a member of the body politic owning a duty of belief. And you can lay it out and they'll agree every single point. But when you give them the conclusion that there are no citizens in states, oh, well, now all the fire and brimstone comes out. Then they gaslight you. And they, they, uh, they, they have to, you know, they, they got to cut the interview short. I did a, an interview, I was happy I finally cracked the St. Louis market. Yeah, I know. 
and I was doing a show called Nothing But The Truth. <laughs> yeah, you can follow Crane Durham's career. He's now doing a, a morning show, and uh, his name is Crane Durham, and I'm going through, and this is about four years ago, and so when I, to make the point really hit home about no duty to protect and no citizens, I go through uh, the Stanley Hilton case. I'll talk about 9-11. And we had listened to the show before I was on. It was a three-hour show. I was the second hour of the show. And we're listening. And my wife is always right about this stuff. We're listening to the show, and she says, you need to call this guy. You need to cancel. He's a handy wannabe and a bad one at that. Don't do the show. I gotta crack this market. Yeah, I gotta, I can't. Boy, she was right. The whole thing took about three, four minutes. So I'm going through the whole 9-11. And it's something we can all agree with. It's not a conspiracy theory to say that those buildings were destroyed that day. You can debate about how they were destroyed, but they came down. And so we're discussing the, I'm discussing the facts and leading to my point. And the point was, why are the widows suing the airlines and not the Bush administration, you know, the government. And so he stops me and he says, wait a minute, are you saying that George Bush allowed 9-11 to happen? Oh, Gina was right again. <laughs> Damn it. You, 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 you. So I, I, I did the best I could. And I said, let me finish my point. I'm all done. We can talk about 9-11 all you want. He said, this is my damn show. You answer the question or you're gone. I'm gone either way. So I figured I got about 30 seconds. So I made the, the, boss, the, the best of it. I said, well, yeah, given the fact that 39 minutes elapsed before anything was done, all the physical evidence points to, yes, they allowed it to happen. They started screaming and cut me off. Audience members are calling, saying, what, do we, what should we think of this guy, Crane? <laughs> <laughs> to his credit, before he said, you can't fix stupid, He said, you have to make up your own mind. Go to his website. He gave the website out. So I give him credit for that. But he's not doing that show anymore. So you be prepared for the emotional response. That's just what you're going to get. And you're programmed to respond that way. And if you don't believe you're programmed to respond that way, uh, Steph, FreedomainRadio.com. <laughs> He's got about 17,000 podcasts that you can listen to and you can get a lot of that. My show has been archived. I don't have enough time to go through it, but we're going to go through some of the psychological reasons and background using science as why you have that emotional response. It's the same reason why the judge is going to get so upset with you or someone else when you ask a simple question. You're attacking part of who they are. They force us into their little schools when we're five, four or five years old, and they ram this crap down our throats day in and day out. There's those flags everywhere. My gosh. You see, Stefan, you lucked out. Living in Canada, you don't have to see all those damn flags. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. He, I, had, I had a flag up. Anyone else put flags up after 9-11? Yeah, I, I did, too. I put the gaps in. <laughs> when they get. <laughs> that wasn't obscure enough. Alright, so you may ask yourself, people like Ron Paul and Barack Obama, are they in on it? Are they pretending? Do they know they're pretending? Because that's all they're doing. There are no presidents. There are no senators. There are no congress. There is no congressman. There is no governor. There's people pretending to be. They're playing a part, just like Bill O'Reilly. It's all staged. You may be saying, but they don't know it. Does that mean they're not pretending? When has consciousness of your actions been an element of schizophrenia? Does a schizophrenic know he's not Napoleon? <laughs> and it's the same here. Now, it's not a personal attack. 
know, Steph and I, we were accused of making personal attacks. This is not. If you think it's a personal attack, direct your hatred and criticism to Steph. Bring it on, baby. I was a vendor at the 2003 Freedom Summit that Ernest Hancock puts on. And Ron Paul was there. Now, Moses Antonio was a friend of mine. He helped with some of the editing of the book. Went up to ask him some questions. You figure, wow, we got a politician, and he's going to be honest. Damn it, he's going to be straightforward. It's Ron Paul. <clears throat> yeah. And he asked him point blank Is the Constitution a contract? You think he answered it? No. Oh, he did. Now, power phrase. I'll show this video where it's somewhere so we can verify this. I, 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 I know Lysander Spooner would disagree. <laughs> but I think it's a contract. And he wouldn't allow a follow-up from Moses. Now, anyone saying it's a contract, you want to follow up. Well, how many elements are in a contract? How many factual elements? Who said that? Oh, Ian. <laughs> yes, there's four. So imagine if you were able to follow up with Ron Paul, another politician, who said that the Constitution was a contract. Really, what are the four factual elements of a contract? Let's see if they exist. Even if they existed in 1789 or 1790, as Lysander points out, they're all dead. They're all dead. So it doesn't matter if they know they're pretending or they don't know because the psychological effect is exactly the same and there's no getting away from that this isn't a law that someone cooked up this is psychological testing these are experiments done with double blind uh, uh, double blind studies they were controlled experiments the Stanford prison experiment is a big one the Stanford prison experiment was a two-week experiment. Now, I know there were some issues because the... It starts with a Z. But uh, the one who did the, t the experiment... What? Mark Zimbardo. Zimbardo. He participated in the experiment. So some would say it's tainted. Now, I'll agree to a certain degree that there, you know, there is some tainting to the experiment, but it has been replicated before. Uh, again, after that. And uh, this two-week experiment had to be stopped in just a few days because they were, got, the ones who were pretending to be guards became sadistic. There weren't cameras everywhere. So they'd pull them out of view cameras. They were beating them. They were peeing on them. It was Abu Ghraib all over. And just because he participated in it. Can you explain the experiment? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll talk about a few of them. I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But they did a mock prison. And they took otherwise healthy college students and split them into two groups. They had prisoners and prison guards. They knew they were pretending. They knew they didn't leave at any time. They got within 36 hours what's called de-individuation. And if that doesn't chill you to your core, it should. You start losing your individual identity. You can only identify as part of a group. What does that sound like? We, trains we can believe in, and I, a better America, we, we. We used to say, unless you're speaking French. <laughs> <laughs> Just we stuff. And so, after the, they got the de-individuation, uh, they noticed that the guards were becoming increasingly sadistic. Now, a psychiatrist used that word, not me. And sadistic is, of course, a sexual pleasure from torture. They weren't just torturing them. They were getting pleasure from it. Uh, where just a few days before, they weren't like that. They wouldn't even think to do that. But it was the situation that they were put in. I'll discuss a little bit more about that later. Uh, they had to stop it. Yeah, I think it was nine days. No, six days. A two-week, 14-day experiment was stopped in six days. Is what they were doing. And they could leave at any time. Why weren't the prisoners leaving? Because the effect, de individuation, they were part of a group. Unless the whole group left, they weren't going to leave. It's pretty sad. 
So you look at this, uh, there's no citizens and residents or politicians, you know, and, and you don't have to, you know, I'm sorry it's not intriguing enough like talking about the Masons, oh, it's the Masons, look at the dollar, 666 six, six and everything, you know, and Sean Hannity doing his six, you know, and that's just the way, you know, you don't have to talk about the Masons, you don't have to talk about the Illuminati, none of that means anything, it's not, it's intriguing that stuff, it's not important. You know, we used to joke around, you, 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 you go in front of the, one of the Mesa courts and they've got the, the dedication stone from the, the Masonic Lodge. Like, oh, I've been filing my paperwork in the wrong place, I've got to go around the corner to the Grand Lodge. But they give us all this, these delusions that we don't see that stuff. We don't see what the actual problem is. We don't, instead of seeing them as killers, thieves, and liars, we see them as honorable members of Congress. They always put honorable. Why? Does your plumber do that? The Honorable Joe Sixpack. <laughs> what other profession needs to do that? Seriously, what other profession needs to give themselves titles like that? Lawyers. Exactly, because people know them for what they are. We gotta give ourselves titles, people are on to us. Well, honorable. Okay. See, those people who call themselves government, they can do that because they have superior public relations. It's one of the things I wrote on the back of the book, it's a question. Is it possible that what you think is real is just a public relations scheme? And you damn well better believe it is. And don't ever think for a moment these people are stupid. So I'm going to bend that. So if I mentioned last night, very important thing, I want to bring it out. The government we see, yeah, they look stupid. The ones who are really in control, they're not stupid. How else can you get hundreds of millions of people to accept pieces of paper as money? If you think these people are stupid and don't understand human psychology and social, uh, okay, socialization, you're dead wrong. Never underestimate them. So don't think for a second, too, that the people who inflict this force or are behind the force, that they don't know what the results are of using paper. It would be like getting into a fight and underestimating your opponent. Ah, what does he know? when you're picking up your teeth because you didn't know what to expect. Never assume. Yeah, and I said in the book, never bring a, uh, just like a Dago to bring a knife to a gunfight <laughs> from the untouchables. I'm half Sicilian, so nobody, no one, hey, what the, go ahead. <laughs> it's not just that you get people to accept these pieces of paper as money but you get people to actually defend it. They defend it, which is amazing. And you talk about gold and silver, and they call it funny money. So I gotta tell you, trying to be as objective and cold as, you know, and scientific as possible, when I see the result that they've got people accepting pieces of paper as money and they're defending it, you're doing a damn good job. They're not stupid. And if you doubt that they're stupid, go and do it yourself. Try getting a hundred million people to accept your pieces of paper. <laughs> You'll realize real quick these are not stupid people that you're dealing with. And some would criticize me, oh Mark, anything can be used, uh, you can use anything as money, even paper. Well, there's two important issues there. Go out and try to issue your own paper. You find out real fast only one group of people are allowed to do that. Just one. And they're willing to kill you to make sure it stays that way. There's plenty of cases to prove that. They have whole sections dealing just with that. It's kind of odd that the Secret Service is inside the Treasury. Yeah, think about that one. 
But getting people to accept these pieces of paper as money isn't entirely based on physical force. It's based on these delusions out and, and outright lies, such as we're citizens, part of a state, that you're a taxpayer. And how do they address you when you get your letters from the IRS? Is it ever, dear Ian, dear taxpayer? It's the same as me sending a letter back saying, dear criminal. <laughs> Thank you. I had one particular one that wouldn't stop. I said, my client's name is, say, Bob. Well, the taxpayer, stop. My client's name is Bob. Well, the taxpayer, if you call him a taxpayer again, I'm going to call you a rapist. <laughs> No, I don't need any more evidence than you do that my client's a taxpayer. <laughs> He's a rapist protester. <laughs> I'm going to do that with a new non-filer, the new politically correct way of saying tax protester. He's resisting being labeled a rapist. <laughs> don't know why. Well, see, it's all bull, and it's easily proven bull. All you have to do is look at the facts. And it's bull right down to the idea that you have rights. Now this is where things get a little sticky. Start telling people they have no rights, and they get really upset. How many people here think they have rights? Raise your hand. Hopefully, you too? Yes. Okay. You just doing that for effect, or? Now, I've had people call the show, very irate, when I say you don't have any rights. You tell me I don't have a right to life, liberty, and happiness? That's what I'm saying. What are rights? Anyone? You have to fight for them. Uh, well, you don't tell me what they are. They're well, they're whatever you fight for. You, so a king has the right to do whatever he wants with the subjects. Why? Because he forces them to do it and because they go along with it. You have but, whatever right you want to set up. But what is it? What is a right? A right is something you can protect. Uh, but it doesn't tell me what it is. My car is something I can protect. It doesn't mean it's a right. Something you can't take away. Well, you know, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> now, a right is a legal claim. That's all it is. It's a legal claim. They only exist in your head. That's it. So I had someone, this guy, saying, you uh, you tell me I don't have the God-given right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? I said, that's what I'm telling you. And if you think otherwise, I'll give you as much time as you need on the show. I'll have you come back on next week. Well, we weren't aware that next week wasn't going to be on. You can come back on <laughs> and prove it. I said, now I can prove to a certain degree right here on the show right now that you have life, liberty, and property. You have life because I can hear you. I can prove that. You have liberty because I'm assuming that there's no one standing there with a gun to your head. You, even if they are, you still made a conscious choice and have liberty, you're still talking. You have liberty. Property? I can pretty much presume that because you've got at least a microphone and an internet connection. So, pro so these are things I can prove. These are tangible. I can make a case you have life, liberty, and property. Now make a case you have a right to life, liberty, and property. Okay? Now, I know why Steph, he's not sitting there like this because he's saying this guy's full of crap. You know, some other people, who doesn't, who doesn't agree? Okay. We'll go through more where we'll, we'll address that after. We'll give you an opportunity to lay the facts out. Because when you start laying the facts out, you're going to come to the same conclusion many U.S. attorneys and prosecutors have come to. No one says. And it's not just because they, don't, they refuse to acknowledge it. Because they don't think you have rights to life, liberty, and property either. But for a different reason. Okay? But because of this BS, because we think we have rights, because we think we're citizens and residents, because of these delusions, if you can get people to accept this BS, you don't need to exert that much force. In fact, if you put the delusions over well enough, you can get your victims to apply the force for you, which is exactly what police and tax agents do. 
a tragic example of getting the victim to do the force for you is someone like Pat Tillman. And if you don't know where Pat Tillman played for the uh, the Phoenix, uh, the, the Ram, Cardinals. He's a pretty pretty good example. Tragic one though. Thought he was fighting for his country. And even when someone does that, when the victim exposes or when the victim uses the violence against other victims for the controllers, they wind up getting shot by friendly fire, they call it. And did they tell the truth? No. So here the guy walks away from a million dollar contract playing with the Cardinals, who eventually actually did get to the Super Bowl, throws it all away to go kill people he's never met in Afghanistan. And they lie to his family about what happened. If you think they're going to stand by you because you defend them, well, the Constitution says I have rights and this, they're not going to stand behind you. Think of Pat Tillman. So this gets back to what I asked earlier. Is it possible to program people to have emotional responses? And I think we know that it is. And anyone that any understanding of human psychology knows this is possible. You can see and hear examples of it every day. Especially if you're listening to a mainstream radio show or on the cast. You'll hear it all the time. The funny thing is, if I say 1 plus 1 equals 3, how many people in here are going to get angry with me? This guy. Get, get him out of here, Sam. <laughs> Okay, but most people, if I say 1 plus 1 is 3, most people will dismiss me as an idiot unless I can convince you I'm the president. Then it's okay. Then it's alright. But you usually don't get offended by statements like that. But it's different if I say there's no such thing as citizens or illegal aliens. I don't know the anger. Why be personally offended? I did an article called There's No Such Thing as an Illegal Alien. Now, how can there be an illegal alien? I'm looking at Steph. How can it be an illegal alien <laughs> unless there are citizens and states? Now, can anyone prove that there are citizens and states? So can anyone prove that there's an illegal alien? See, it's okay to let Steph speak now. He's, he's good. I'll try to do English. <laughs> <laughs> well, why the anger? Where does it come from? And why defend the very people who are living off of you as a parasite? They've programmed you. Plain and simple. You've been programmed. We've all been programmed. Okay? It just, it, the difference with these lies, it becomes a part of who we are. If I, you know, I didn't get, look, I didn't get angry when my parents told me, you know, I found out that my parents lied that it was Santa Claus. Yeah, I beat the shit out of them. But I didn't get angry. <laughs> and depending on your perspective, the apparent human need to bond and belong to a group is either a curse or a blessing. It's all perception. To those who want to control and feed off of us, it's certainly a blessing and one they cash in on every day. Think about how many times a friend has asked you about how a certain sports team did by asking, how did we do? As if you're a part of that damn team. As if you had anything to do with that team winning. Kind of because they stole your money to pay for the stadium. And I think this is why I'm interested really in only individual type sports. I really like Olympic weightlifting. Because I gotta tell you, if anyone ever said, you know, it just sounds so stupid. Demas perform, he competed today? How do we do? Do you see how, how ridiculous it is to think that we, I'm a part of this guy lifting? And you watch the Olympics, you're like, he's brought the whole nation of Greece together. <laughs> I don't mean to offend anybody Greek in the audience. <laughs> and I think with sports teams, they must be laughing at everyone. They get politicians to steal your energy. They use it to build stadiums. And then they charge you to watch them play. You even pay to park your car. So then while they receive millions for scoring more points than the other team, you think, we won! What did you win? <laughs> what the hell did you get? <laughs> if one, if one 
is synonymous with what the TSA is doing, then you did win. You got it good. <laughs> so pe calling people, well, people calling themselves government, they're not stupid. And that's, you know, because there are people who think, very public people who think that they are, they're the opinion that the government we see is stupid, so they can't pull off something like 9-11. They're so stupid, you're going to continue paying them 90% of your, in, uh, your energy, your time. They're so incompetent, you keep paying them. Who's the stupid one? You gotta ask, you know? They're so incompetent, allegedly, that they are able to get trillions of dollars of your energy with minimal force. That is not stupid, that is very, very smart. And then they turn around and they poke fun at us. Not everyone recognizes they're laughing at us. Donald Rumsfeld, September 10th, 2001. We can't account for 2.3 trillion. It's gone. It's gone. Next day, the Pentagon's hit. You can watch any TV show with cops. There are no coincidences. 2.3 trillion dollars. How does it disappear? 2.3 trillion. They're laughing at us. They're laughing. If I didn't sign for the meal last night, the bartender would lose his job. This guy is admitting to losing 2.3 trillion. So the difference is when you're not a normal person, you don't lose your job. You get to steal trillions more, lose it, destroy a couple of buildings, and then have people put flags all over their cars and give you trillions more to lose. Oh, and you can submit to humiliating body cavity searches when you travel. But the French, you gotta call them Freedom Fries, right? <laughs> These delusions differ from the Santa Claus one because they become a part of our identity. My saying one plus one is three doesn't affect your identity in any way. But getting it to affect your identity is how you get people to kill strangers. They'll kill for you, and they'll kill people they've never met and know nothing about. You remember the famous line that Muhammad Ali said. I don't want to, you know, I know I'm not going to say it, but basically, ain't no Viet Cong ever called me a... And it's right on the money. And what's always gotten me is how they can get people to kill like that. If you ever watch the old movies like The Revolution, nobody can convince me this is not thinning the herd. It's a population control. And it always follows or is right near a high inflationary period. Watch them marching into cannon fire. How do you get men to leave their families and march to cannons? And if you doubt for a moment that war is not by choice to make a profit, I want to turn your attention to World War I during Christmas. Is anyone familiar with the Christmas armistice? If that does not convince you, I'm going to I will just mention it for a bit. They stopped. In the middle of a battle, they stopped fighting. Some even play football, as the legend goes. You've got men who are trying to kill each other and they stopped. It's about thinning the herd. See, stupid people are not the ones getting people to kill for them over four damn pieces of paper. They understand human behavior and damn it, they understand it pretty well. And they understand it better than most of us in this room. They've done their groundwork and the victims now do most of the work for them. So I coined a phrase called residual tyranny. And it's similar to in sales, when you make a sale, you get a commission. And as long as that contract is renewed, you will keep getting a commission. And if you keep forcing the bullshit down people's throats, they get their kids to grow up and feed it to their kids, and you get residual tyranny. They will gladly shoot you on the side of the street because you don't give them a license fast enough. They cannot tell you why you have to produce that identification. But they will kill you nonetheless. 
It's why we have cops, soldiers, and tax agents. They buy into the delusion they are a citizen and, and that the government is there to protect them every damn much as the average person does. They believe this stuff. They do all the dirty work. Lenny called them useful idiots. Because they're too stupid or they're too deluded to realize what they're doing. That's why Voltaire is credited with saying, as long as people believe in absurdities, they will commit, continue to commit atrocities because the Jews were destroying the economy. Because the Armenians, I could go on. It's the nature of the job. And no one, not even Ron Paul, is going to change it. The reason why you have these atrocities is explained by the Stanford Prison Experiment. They're pretending. You have a huge prison experiment that is going on right now. We're all a part of it. This public relations and delusions that divert us away from that all too present machine gun. Together with the Stanford Prison Experiment, you look at the Milgram Experiment. 67% of the time, you will get people to follow what authority says simply because they have no responsibility. I can't get into all the details, but you put the Stanford Prison Experiment together with the Milgram Experiment. And then with Solomon Ash's work in the Ash conformity test, and you have the stuff of nightmares, pretty much what we have in government now. And what should anger you is not the truth, that you have these experiments that are showing human behavior. Well, if we put you in the right situation, sir, you'll kill your neighbor. You'll drown children if you're in the right circumstances. The irony, which should make you really upset, <laughs> All right. <laughs> what should anger you is how they continue to laugh at us. As important as these experiments are, who paid for them? We did. They stole the money. So it's a way of saying, hey, We've got every reason why you should throw every politician in the river and abolish government now and never accept it ever again and end war in your lifetime. Right here. These are the reasons why. But you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. You know why? Solomon Ash told us why. And I think it could be the greatest human tragedy in the history of the world. You think that not just everyone here, maybe nobody buys into this crap anymore. But according to Solomon Ash and his experiments, we're too afraid because we don't know that no one buys it. So according to the Solomon Ash experiment, which has been done, replicated many times, we will continue answering or giving the wrong answer or acting on the wrong answer because we think our friends believe it. Think of that. Think of the tragedy, all the killing that is being done because we are going to base our actions on what we think everyone else is doing. So instead of abolishing government after seeing these experiments that they stole the money for to pay, instead of throwing them out, we watch Candid Camera and we laugh about it. Oh, the guy in the elevator turned around when everyone else did. They're making fun of us. It's my opinion, anyway. They, they're doing it knowingly. It's just like the whole housing boom. We talked about this yesterday. I've spoken about this a lot. Don't think for a moment that they didn't engineer the housing boom in the bus. Because they did. And anybody in the television industry knows that's true. Because you do not get all those stupid flip a house shows on the air in the middle of the boom. Doesn't happen. Doesn't work that way. That does take years of planning to do. So they engineered it. They knew what was going on. And I've heard it over and over before. I say, we talk about the government we can't see. Give me a name. You hear all those, and even Ron Paul gets these, uh, oh, the 
smoke-filled conspiracy crack. Oh, well, there's guys with cigars meeting in a room plotting destruction of the world, the Masons. Give me a name. If someone broke into your house and you didn't, and you had all the evidence of it. The dog is dead. The house is the the, the, the door is on the floor. Okay, all your pot plants are gone. <laughs> <laughs> You've got all this evidence there. Somebody was in your house and took your stuff, but you don't know the name. Does that mean you weren't robbed? Somebody is raped. We don't know the identity, but all the physical proof is there. Does that mean that just because you don't know the name of the attacker, you weren't attacked? That's what they'll do to you on a radio show. Oh, not free talk live. <laughs> But they'll do that to you on Coast to Coast. Give me a name. Who's behind this? I don't know. I don't know. We're dealing with pretty smart people. So I like to respond with, look, there's a body on the floor, four gunshot wounds to the back of head. It's evidence somebody was killed and probably not with their consent. <laughs> Anybody who needs the name of the perp to be convinced somebody was murdered is either a complete idiot Although in India, they could do really well for Fo at Fox News. <laughs> See, we're, program we're programmed to accept these delusions. And we're programmed mostly by the other victims. Remember the residual tyranny. You're going to see the residual tyranny all the time now. Like I said, we're forced to put children in our school in schools or concentration camps. And anyone who doubts you cannot be killed for educating your children at home, you need to go to voluntaries.com, Carl Wadner, a uh, wonderful writer, wrote an article about the Singer family, John Singer. Every, anyone familiar with John Singer? He must be a homeschooler. <laughs> John, they refused to put their kids in public school. They were homeschooling. <laughs> oh my gosh. And he was, he was shot. And what stunned me, I've done, but I, I thought I was doing a libertarian show. And so we're, I'm discussing with the host before the show what we're going to talk about, and we just got on the thing about compulsory education. And Andrew said to me, he's from Florida, but it wasn't you. This was a, what are you, there's no compulsory education, what are you talking about? When, when you're five, they take your children for a few hours a day, and it lasts till they're 18. But that, there's no such thing. I'm thinking I'm talking to, you know, Sean Hannity's producer. What, what are you talking? What do you mean? You have to... You're going to have to show me a statue. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I, don't call this show again. Get... I couldn't believe it. But, uh... Oh, uh but, but it is true. If you don't put your kids in their school, you will... They'll, they'll, they'll either take your kids or kill you in the process. Um, so, and, and, and when we believe others may accept these delusions, uh, then we tend to stick with the delusions, knowing the delusions. Uh, and, do, and do you think the parasites of society know this? Like I said, they pay for these experiments. They stole the money from us and conducted experiments, so they know this very well. So, in reality, very few people may accept the delusions, you know, may actually accept the delusions as true. And just want to, real quick, before I have to wrap up and go, there's evidence that they know of this, and it's right in the Declaration of Independence. They know all these scientific stuff. They know how people respond. Because they said, mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So they know all. They, they, they know this stuff. So how do we cut through the delusions that we're bombarded with on TV and radio? And, well, of course not FTL. How do, we, how do we get through this? And this is one of the ways that I've been successful in helping people with IRS attacks. Stick to the facts. That's all you got to do. It's that simple. If you go to the website, I have a video where you can hear a call from someone in the California Franchise Tax Board. This is all I had to do to shut the woman down. Is there a factual and legal distinction or difference between income and taxable income? Yeah. Do you know what they are? I can't answer that. You're damn right you can't answer. You know why? There is no such thing as income and taxable income. Well, definitely not taxable income. So it's sticking to the facts. 
So like I did, you want to first establish exactly what a right is. Then you can go about establishing evidence or producing some proof. So until you can identify the Constitution, you have to identify what it is, and then you can start talking about how it applies to somebody and why uh, you're entitled to take their house because of it. Focus on the facts. It's enough just to ask somebody factually what is a citizen. Then all you have to do is be quiet, they'll stutter a little bit, and then you get a predictable emotional response. And it's like, oh no, you've personally attacked a group that they belong to. I'm a citizen of the state. Oh, and then you know what they're going to do next? They're going to call the local clear channel station and say, my neighbor hates America and doesn't support the troops. So that's what you get. <laughs> The emotional responses happen more time than I can, I can recall, and I'm only, I, my time is very short, so I'm going to just go through one quick one, where I was at the gym, and there was a former cop that I had been friends with. I, he was a former cop, and he had gotten a ticket and was really ticked off that he got his ticket, so I'm giving him some legal advice. <laughs> And so I explain, oh, well, it's very easy. Put the cop on a stand and ask two questions. <laughs> and the, did you file a valid cause of action against me? And then, uh, then the cop says, well, yes. And then, and then I, well, how many elements are in a valid cause of action? Now, he thought this was, at first, one, wow, that's so easy. And then he started thinking, wait, but cops aren't taught this stuff. He's getting mad at me. <laughs> you put a gun on and you pull people over. You're willing to shoot them. And you don't know if there's a cause of action against them. Real nice. Can you understand the emotional response now? So, yeah, pretty bad. So we get the emotional response oh, simply because we're exposing the delusions. So we stick to the facts, you cut through all that, and it makes dealing with the IRS a lot easier. I wish I had more time, but I want to thank everyone for coming in today. Be out talking to people, right? Yeah, the angry ones, I told you, you <laughs> take that out with staff. <laughs> is, is Patry here? He's my full guy today.